definitely going to be doing another round of this because I've bought two books for the last two months from Book of the Month. Hey y'all, my name is Nat. I hope you're having a terrific day today and for this video we are going to be doing a Raid My Shelves of my Book of the Month books. Before we get into anything bookish, however, make sure to hit like and subscribe down below, as well as tell me in the comments, do you have book of the month? And if so, what is the best book you've ever read from it? All right, so if you're new here, Raid My Shelves is pretty self-explanatory. Basically, I just try and make a reading vlog out of books from my shelves. Usually I go for some sort of a theme, whether it be genre, trope, author, but I don't know why. I never thought of doing my book of the month books until I watched Books with Lexi do a reading vlog of her book of the month books and I thought that's ingenious. So this is an excuse for me to finally make some progress on them because I do have a bad habit of buying books from book of the month and not really prioritizing them ever. I attempted to go with a little bit of a theme. I tried maybe like the three books I had had the longest. I tried three different genres but in the end what we came out with was just an amalgamation of books that I felt like reading. So first up is Love and Other Disasters by Anita Kelly. This is a romance book which is put on the set of a baking competition show and we are following Dahlia who has recently been divorced and is trying to find a new passion in life and honestly the winnings would probably help her do that. On the opposite side we have London who is the first non-binary contestant who is just trying to find a name for themselves while also taking something they're really passionate about and maybe finally turning it into a full-time gig. I've heard tons of positive things about this one and as somebody who absolutely adores cooking competition shows, oh yeah, I had to pick this one up whenever I heard that element. Next is a book that is actually on my five-star predictions list and that is The Inheritance of Orchidea Divina by Zoraida Cordova. Is anybody impressed that I didn't just smack myself in the face with this? Because it flashed before my eyes for a sec. This is a magical realism generational story which I believe is following the family of Orchidea Divina after she has died and I believe she passes on magic abilities to three of her grandchildren and we see how that affects their lives. I've heard the writing in this is absolutely jaw-dropping, super gorgeous, and that's something that I tend to really love. See my adoration for Aaron Morgenstern up above. I don't think I've ever read a generational story, but that is a sort of trope that I have been really intrigued about picking up. But really though, the reason I made this a book of the month pick was because of this cover. I mean, this is jaw-droppingly stunning, and I don't even really like faces on my covers, but this is so beautiful. And then finally, I am going to be doing Darling Girl by Liz Michalski. Honestly, I heard Peter Pan retelling and basically hit add to box. I do know this is following the granddaughter of Wendy and this family are the only ones who know that Peter Pan is in fact a real person. However, he is a little bit more dangerous than the stories would lead people to believe and when her daughter who has been kept in some sort of an ICU goes missing, she knows it had to be Peter. I've honestly not heard anybody talk about this book. Peter Pan retelling. Like I said, honestly, all I needed to know. Um, this does sound a good bit darker than Lost in the Neverwoods by Aiden Thomas did. Also, it's adult, so I'm hoping that that will kind of take things even further. With that, I am really intrigued to see how this plays out. Plus, I do think there might be a bit of a romance with the Captain Hook character, and I'll admit, I'm, I'm into that. All right, so I will talk to you guys again when I have started into one of these books. Hey guys, so I have finally, finally started into my January book of the month. <laughs> I have hit the halfway point, and if you can't tell from my tabs, I'm having a great time. I'm really enjoying this. I think given that the setting is basically MasterChef, it's not surprising that I am loving that element of it. I definitely think if you don't enjoy food, if you don't care about hearing the stuff that goes into making a food-related TV show, you're probably not gonna enjoy that element. But given that I am a major consumer of food, Food Network and I'm currently in the middle of a oh god fifth rewatch of Kitchen Nightmares. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely enjoying that part. But really the major element of this, the romance I'm sucked in. I'm so sold on these two. London is a grumpy cinnamon roll and they are so gone for Dahlia. I absolutely love that. But at the same time, Dahlia is weird, chaotic, and just trying to find a new happy for herself now that she has divorced from her ex-husband and unfortunately doesn't really have a job and has no real idea of what she wants to do with her life. So she has made her way onto this TV show and she's just trying to find a new happiness for herself. 
And I love that part of what makes her so happy on this show is London. <laughs> like, they're so cute together. They're so precious. I definitely think both of them are pretty well-rounded out characters. I think there's been enough background established without giving us way too much. They each kind of have their side plots that lean into why they're on the show, but overall, I do think this is very true to just being a romance. Part of me is surprised at the amount of time we're seeing the two two of them together not on the show, but I'm also not surprised by that because once they're on the show, obviously their interactions are pretty limited. Like they can't really go and hang out, you know, in the pantry. They have to be focusing on making their dishes. Hi Sam. Hey baby. But even when they are on the show, they are each other's cheerleaders, they are each other's therapists, they just are there for each other through the ups and the downs. And even though this book is moving really quickly, I keep having to remind myself that we've worked through a fair amount of time. Like it's at least been a month since they met each other. So it makes sense that they've developed through the friend space quite quickly. And by this point at the halfway, have hit the lovers phase. <laughs> Not mad about that either. The spice, she good. It's good. There is a little bit of heavier topics popping up, obviously with London being openly non-binary on this TV show. Unfortunately, they are being subjected to some transphobia, some trolls. Their father is not particularly accepting of their identity. Thankfully, there isn't too much of that, so it doesn't bring the entire tone of the book down. On the opposite side with Dahlia, while she is trying to find a new happiness for herself, unfortunately, her divorce has definitely left some damage. And apart from that, she is still having to work through her student loans. So if she were to win the show, she could take that money and finally kind of make a clean slate for herself. But again, even with both of those more serious topics, I don't think they're taking away from the main plot, which is the romance. And I don't think they're bringing the entire mood down. This is still very lighthearted. I'm working through it pretty quickly. I'm really enjoying it across the board, really enjoying it. I guess given that I'm updating at 50%, I could give a estimated rating. And right now I'm gonna say high four stars. I'm really enjoying this and I'm glad I'm finally getting around to it. Can't believe it's taken me eight months at the time of me reading this. Hey guys, so I officially finished out Love and Other Disasters by Anita Kelly and right out of the gate I just need to say this was so cute, it was so pure, it was so wholesome, I really enjoyed it. I think each of these main characters' personalities really just sprung off the page the entire book. I thought the relationship that develops between them, it weirdly feels like a mix between a whirlwind vacation fling and then like the start of a very serious relationship. It's so cute, it balances that so well where it has the fun side but then it also has the emotional depth. Yes, I need more romance books to have that. While I did have a lot of fun with the cooking show setting, I do think as the story progressed, it um, started to be underutilized. The stakes never really felt like they were very high. Even when one of our main characters would be in danger of getting voted off the show, oftentimes it was over within an instant. It was very anticlimactic if they were saved or if they weren't. I don't want to specifically tell you because of spoilers. So that element unfortunately did start to become a bit of a letdown seeing as how I loved it in the first half. The focus here was really on the relationship between these two, unsurprisingly. We did have a third act conflict, and while it was kind of annoying, I will admit it did make perfect sense. It was realistic to these characters and their situation, and it led to a very sweet, very cute, pure, adorable grand gesture moment. In regards to London's side plot, their father wasn't accepting of their gender identity, and thankfully at no point did that side plot ever become this angsty drama filled situation. It definitely was a bit heart aching at times, but I don't think it ever took away from the overall romance plot or bring down the positive tone. I think Anita Kelly handled it in a really respectful way. Even when a contestant actually misgenders London, they don't actually showcase that on the page. And I think that was a really powerful way for that moment to still occur without disrespecting London's gender identity. On the opposite side with Dahlia, I really loved she finally has this discussion with her mom that was so sweet and wholesome and really had Dahlia reevaluating her perspective on not only her divorce but her relationship with her mom and herself and her outlook on life which also kind of 
lent in with the grand gesture moment and I just I loved that on the whole it was so great I was just swooning for these two across the board I had a great time with this like I said in terms of the cooking element unfortunately that did kind of detract from my enjoyment so I went with four stars but still highly recommend this book I had a ton of tabs and I'm definitely keeping this baby on my shelves I can't believe it took me so long to get to it but I'm probably gonna say that a lot in this video Hey y'all, so it has been a hot second since I've had the chance to update you guys, mostly because I went back and forth on if I was going to update at the halfway point for this book. Once I hit the halfway point, I realized like I didn't have that much to really talk about. And even now after having finished it, I still don't have a ton to talk about just because of how this book is. It's really difficult to verbalize with my thoughts without getting into too many spoilery things. Also, I ended up kind of having to reread the entire first half of the book. I I started this book on Scribd through the audiobook, but unfortunately for me, about every chapter, a paragraph or so would just blank out. No matter what I did, I couldn't get it to actually play that. The only way I found that would fix it would be to completely clear out the app and clear my history and then restart everything. And I didn't want to do that every single chapter. Not to mention whenever I'm listening to audiobooks, it's usually while I'm doing something that I can't conveniently get my phone out. It didn't work. I tried to push through without worrying about it, but by the halfway point, I really thought it was starting to detract from my enjoyment. So I decided to go back and re read it physically. Having finished it, I can say that was probably the best decision I could have made because I actually was able to annotate it as I read, and I do think that made me enjoy this a lot more. The writing in this is absolutely beautiful, and the character work is fantastic, particularly for me around Orchidia and her granddaughter Marimar. However, we are also following Ray and Tatanelli Marimar's cousins. I just didn't feel like they leapt off the page quite as much in comparison to Orchidia and Marimar. Ray did start to grow on me as the book progressed forward, but for the most part, he still never really top either of the other two. So this alternates perspective between Orchidia and the three cousins. I did not realize we were actually going to see from Orchidia's perspective. I was really starting to enjoy seeing how she became this witchy woman who lived in a house that sort of appeared out of nothing. So fantastically fleshed out. She had such a personality, and even though she wasn't always likable, it was really hard hard to hate her at any point. And Marimar was like that for me as well. They just both had so much personality. They were both morally gray. And at the same time, I think in those two in particular, we really were able to see how their trauma had really shaped their lives. Family is such an important element in this and familial relationships are definitely very important as well. Many of the different family members we see each have like their own little role that they play within the family. But in terms of specific relationships, I do think my favorite was between Marimar and Ray. They definitely were more like siblings than cousins. The banter between them was so realistic to siblings. In terms of setting, I really liked how this rode the line between being contemporary and fantastical. It was just so whimsical. And I definitely think where the house was located and where a lot of the story is set added into the fairy tale feel that this had. Since this does have a magical realism, I also really enjoyed the very soft magic system with this. The magic it could almost just be brushed aside as silly superstition and I, I don't know why I just really enjoyed that element of it where if you knew how wonderful and fantastical this family really was it was so impressive but if you didn't it just seems really silly and outrageous and out there which is definitely what this family comes across to a lot of their neighbors and people who know them. I definitely felt like the atmosphere in this was really just brought to life particularly in the memories we would see between the three cousins of the house and the valley where a lot of them grew up in. This is a very character driven book but in terms of a plot it's almost like a family drama. We're exploring the trauma Orchidia has lived through, how it has really impacted her, her choices, and how it is now starting to impact her children and grandchildren by extension. All while being wrapped up in this very beautiful lyrical writing and these really layered characters. When I was first expecting to update at the halfway point I specifically wrote I'm so impressed with how much has been established 
established and taken place within only 160 pages. Now, by the end of this book, I think the same thing. I can't believe how much really built out from this book just over 300 pages. It was really impressive on Cordova's part in terms of writing. In terms of plot, though, in the second half, there is kind of this fantastical mystery. Oh my gosh, I was so hooked. Once we hit the climax, like, I did not see any of those twists and reveals coming, and it had me so enthralled with this beautifully disturbing imagery and these stakes that we're just raising and raising. The ending was heart-wrenching but so sweet. I just, I really enjoyed this one. I can't believe it took me so freaking long to get to this book. Even though it was on my five-star predictions list, it did come out to roughly a 4.5 on my call pile. Honestly, I'm giving this baby five stars. It was so good. Like, this was such a perfect book for me. Thankfully, I do think this showcases that I know my reading taste. The writing is just phenomenal and I'm definitely gonna have to check out more of Cordova's work. Sam's playing over there, so if you hear a bunch of background noise, that's that's him. So, hey guys, I hit the halfway point into Darling Girl by Liz Michalski, and you know, let's start with the positives. Let's let's be nice here. So going into this, I really love the idea of it. I was very invested by the plot of a evil Peter Pan, specifically with the setting of the real world. Like, I thought that was a very cool way to retell this story. And thus far, I think one element that I'm really enjoying with that is there are multiple different characters within this story that actually have the similar names or are in a similar position as characters in the original Peter Pan. Our main character character Holly has actually taken notice of that and I'm curious to see where that element is going to go. It kind of gives that additional fantastical feel apart from obviously Peter Pan because everything else in this book is pretty contemporary. So with that the plot itself does have me pretty intrigued. On top of it however we just recently met our Hook character and I like him. I want more of him. He definitely is going to keep me reading I can tell you that. Is it because I'm picturing Colin O'Donoghue in my head? Maybe but still. And then finally the flow of the writing definitely feels pretty similar to like other fairy tales. It's not quite what I got with like To Kill a Kingdom or The Bone Houses where it mixes that beautiful flowery fairy tale whimsical writing with a dark tone, but it's like kind of there. It's 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 making its way there. Now, I'm not gonna roast this book necessarily because I'm not underwhelmed with it, but I'm also not overwhelmed. I'm kind of just whelmed. Thus far, it's just like things are happening and I'm like, yeah, sure, that happened. With the base plot of a child in a coma being kidnapped by a fantastical character, feels like this should have very high stakes. Unfortunately, our main character, Holly, who is the driving force investigating this situation, just feels like she's running around like a chicken with her head cut off. She has no real idea of how to go about finding her child. She's consistently just kind of hoping she's gonna stumble upon Peter in one of these places. Because of that, it feels like there isn't really much of a drive to solve the mystery. And then to pair with that, the pacing just feels all over the place because of it. When Holly finally, finally asks people for help, she does so in a way where they can't really help her because she gives half-ass answers the entire way through. Meaning the people trying to help her don't really understand the full context of the situation or the ramifications of it either. Which is also very similar to how the author half-asses telling us about the background until more than halfway into the book. She attempts to build suspense with that whole element by by having our main character keep things back until it's relevant, but it's honestly just aggravating to me. I'm just frustrated that I don't know these answers, particularly since I'm only seeing through the eyes of Holly. It feels weird that she would be like keeping secrets from herself. As far as characters go, I will say Holly, our main character, is the most fleshed out. We do get to see through her perspective and kind of really understand her as a person. She is a successful scientist, she's a very devoted mother, and uh, honestly is probably a great paycheck for some therapist out there. In comparison, all other big name characters, namely her mom and her son, are a dragon lady and a angsty hormonal teenager, respectively. As I said at the beginning, we just recently met our Hook character, and I do like him. I'm intrigued by his character. We don't really see a lot of exploration of it, but he definitely has some trauma, which I think is kind of allowing Holly to connect with him, and I would love for that to be explored. I do think this does start to look at them in a romantic light, which I would be into. Finally, the one thing that I really just want to bring attention to is content warning for on 
Rampage rape scene. Very startling. Did not expect that. But at the same time, it also feels like the author kind of glossed over it and the events were never really explained further or explored in any kind of way. There's just, there's been no discussion around that event. And I don't like that. That's really weird. It feels like it just happened and now it's getting swept under the rug. And it's like, what was the point of it then if you were going to include it and then just not acknowledge it ever again? Like I said, um, I'm not overwhelmed. I'm not underwhelmed. I'm whelmed. This feels like it's gonna be just a solid three star unless it continues to get worse in regards to the whole mystery. In that case, I could see this dropping down to a two star. I really hope that doesn't happen. I am gonna keep reading just because I'm kind of curious about where it's gonna go, but I'm upset that I don't like this as much as I thought I was going to. <laughs> Hey y'all, so I officially finished out Darling Girl and uh, this ended up being exactly what I thought it was gonna be. Three stars exactly in my copile breakdown. It was fine. In regards to the fairy tale retelling element, specifically when Holly notices that there are different characters in her own life similar to the characters in the original story of Peter Pan, I liked that, but in the end it just was completely underutilized. It basically just was swept away. I She like acknowledges the fact that this happens, but nothing ever came of it, making me wonder what the heck was the point in pointing this out or even doing it if you weren't going to use it in any interesting way within the plot. In regards to pacing, this did continue to do a very wonky back and forth thing up until 75% in. Then we stayed fast paced because Holly was finally working her way towards getting some answers. We were nearing Peter's location until we get to the climax and then it just drops back to slow. My biggest gripe though, with the climax is the fact that we literally don't see it happen. We are led right up to it and then Holly is not even there. She is told about the events through other characters, which is so weird. Like, I... <laughs> It just feels like we watched all of this build up only for the author to give us a quick summarization because she didn't feel like playing out the actual climax. It seems like such a cop out. It, I, I don't I don't understand that from a writing perspective. I will say this did have some twists I wasn't anticipating, though they weren't jaw dropping or shocking really. They were just kind of, oh, that's that's not what I was expecting. Cool. That was it. My gripe in the beginning with Holly consistently lying to the people who are trying to help her figure out what happened to her daughter and find Peter continued all the way through this and honestly towards the end I was just getting incredibly frustrated with it and it was making it very hard to sympathize with Holly because she was standing in her own way to actually trying to find her daughter or find Peter. Not to mention she does actually get called out on all of these lies that she has been telling to everyone in her life and anytime that would happen, she either would become very angry that she was being called out or she would play the victim and it was so aggravating because it just made it so that I genuinely despised Holly by the end of the book. I could not stand her. I don't think she redeemed herself at all by the end of this. There is a little bit of a romance between Holly and Christopher who's the hook character. Wasn't really surprised with that. Uh, it just was super underdone. Did not see how it developed other than the author wanting to capitalize on the romanticizing of Captain Hook, but that was about it. I wasn't convinced by their feelings for one another at all. On the opposite side, once we finally met Peter, he honestly felt cartoonishly evil. I, th I think what the author had built with that character previously was well done, but once we finally saw him, it kind of just took everything she built and then just turned it up too many notches. It was just odd and I feel like it really was a disappointment given how his character had been used as a underlying presence throughout the rest of the book, so that was very disappointing. In regards to the on-page rape scene, um, it finally is actually acknowledged as rape later on in the book, but even then it's still not discussed. It feels like it was done for shock value and then it got swept away with really no exploration of the repercussions that had. So yeah, I'm gonna be unhauling this one. Definitely bummed about it. I wanted a Peter Pan retelling, which I would love. Also, the cover is just really cool. I like the intricacies of this and then also this Big Ben on the back. 
back. I'm bummed. At least I finally caught up on my book of the month books. G says while well, still having six books from book of the month unread. All right y'all, so that is it for today. Thank you so much for coming to my channel. I really appreciate it. Make sure to hit like and subscribe down below. I have all my socials linked in the description if you're interested in keeping up with what I am reading. I come out with videos on Monday and Friday, but until then I hope you continue to have a terrific day. Love you, bye!